Uh, good evening. I'd like to call the Monday, March 20th, 2023, Burlington's uh, regularly scheduled select board meeting to order. Uh, with us tonight on my far left is Flo Smith. To my right is Tor Nelson. Uh, Joe Staub is on video. And uh, the first agenda item is uh, reorganization of the board. I move to appoint Brad Town as chair of the select board for the 2023-2024 year. Second. Any other discussion? Those in favor? Aye. Aye. And now we come to vice chair. I move to appoint Flo Smith as the vice chair. Second. All those in favor? Aye. And now we need a, a um, secretary. I make the motion to to um, elect or I nominate Joe Staub as secretary. Oh, second. Any, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Very good. Um, additions or changes to the agenda? None. Okay. Uh, public comment. Hearing none, um, regional concerns meeting with AOT. I'll let you folks introduce yourselves. Okay, I'll get my screen shared here. So we do have a presentation that's gonna be up behind folks. So a little turn around over here. Sure. Um, so welcome, and can you hear me on the mic? Am I loud enough? Yeah. Yeah, good, perfect. So this is the alternatives presentation meeting for Bridge 67 on Vermont Route 12 over the Dog River. Um, I'm Laura Stone. I'm the VTrans Scoping Project Manager. We also have uh, Adam Goudreau. If you can raise your hand. He's going to be the Design Project Manager. And Todd Sumner, we have a consultant on board for the scoping and design of this project. This is uh, Todd Sumner from Hoyle Tanner. Um, so really the purpose of the meeting, we want to uh, provide an understanding of our approach to the project, talk about the project constraints, talk about the constraints around the bridge, um, discuss the alternatives that we considered in the scoping report and talk about our recommended alternative. Ultimately, we really want to gain consensus, build consensus towards, um, towards an alternative for this project. I have at the bottom there provide an opportunity to ask questions and voice concerns. Um, I'm happy to take questions uh, or concerns anytime you can um, you can interrupt me. I also noticed on the Zoom call we have Judith Ehrlich. She's the VTrans Historic Preservation Officer. So this is a historic trust and so any questions related to the historic nature can be directed towards Judith. So here's the uh, here's a location map, an aerial view of the project. It's a little small, um, hard to see for the folks in the room. Um, but it's located um, it's really near the, the Chandler Road and Vermont Route 12 uh, intersection just north of the train tracks there that cross over Vermont Route 12. It's the, the truss bridge that crosses over the Dog River. Um, so first I'm going to talk about the VTrans project development process pretty quickly um, just so folks can get an idea of where we are in the process. Again, we're gonna talk about the existing conditions of the bridge, uh, the alternatives we considered, and a recommended alternative. Um, we'll talk about the maintenance of traffic options that we considered and our recommended maintenance of traffic option schedule. So when you can expect to see this in construction, summary and questions again at the bottom, but you can um, interrupt us at any time. We're happy to take questions. Um, so here's a timeline of the VTrans project development process. And this slide's really just to show that we're at a really, really early stage of project development. 
a project's been funded and this stage called project definition has been identified. Um, this is where we identify the cultural resources, the environmental resources, um, the other constraints surrounding the bridge, utilities, etc. cetera. Uh, we have evaluate alternatives and at the end of that process, we have a scoping report. Um, here we are at the public participation piece um, and ultimately we really want to build consensus towards, uh, towards a project. After this project definition phase, product will be defined. That's when we're going to move into project design. We're going to start quantifying the areas of impact, start the environmental permitting process, the right-of-way process. That's when we're really going to have um, a detailed plans, estimates, specifications. After project design, the contract will be awarded and the uh, project will move into construction. So really, we're at an early, early stage of project development. This is when we want to hear the public's questions, concerns, because this is a really good uh, point in the project process that we can um, incorporate some of those concerns. Um, this is just some descriptions of the terms that we use. Um, you'll hear us talk about abutment, really the abutment or the substructure. That's what we call the um, the support to the foundations at either end of the bridge. And then in this, this picture is just a conventional steel beam bridge. So we do have a truss for bridge 67, but same idea, the beams underneath and the deck, we refer to that as the superstructure. I'll hand it over to Todd. Thank you, Laura. All right, uh, I'm Todd Sunder, I'm with Will Tanner, I'm the Central Project Manager. And uh, so let's start off with what is the purpose and need for this project? Well, the purpose is to provide a safe, reliable, and environmentally sustainable multimodal transportation system that is affordable to use and to operate. The needs come into two major categories. One is to improve the narrow width. Um, it's substandard width for vehicles and is a serious safety concern for bicyclists due to the traffic volumes and no shoulders. So as everyone knows, this bridge is narrow if you ever driven across it. It's 21 feet rail to rail. And based on current traffic volumes, it needs to be 28 feet uh, rail to rail per Vermont state standards. Also, there's safe, serious safety concerns as bicyclists. For bicyclists, there is no shoulders. And this area of uh, Vermont 12 it has been identified as a high priority bicycle corner by B Trans. Everybody can hear me okay? That's good. Yes. We're still good? All right. So, the other big important category here is the condition of the bridge. Um, there's lots, I have lots of slides coming up where we can talk about that. Uh, but before I move off on this one, I do want to bring up that there is maintenance concerns as well as the condition, uh, such as we had an emergency repair that was needed this past fall on that bridge. Remember being closed, not closed down, but down to one lane for a while. So that was, that's still an ongoing concern. Uh, and basically the bridge is at the end of its service life. So let's talk about some of the existing conditions. Uh, this, is a, this is not 12 through here, it's a major collector. Uh, as Paul already stated, it's bridge number 67. It was constructed in 1934 and it's owned by the state of Vermont. It's a 140 foot long Pratt through truss and it was fabricated by the American Bridge Company. And if you go down to the bridge, the plaque is still on it, stating that. So. All right, I've already said before, it's 21 feet between the existing rails, but if you've ever been on it, the usable space between those rails is really closer to 20 feet. Um, originally, this bridge had a 15-foot vertical clearance from the top of the deck to the underside of the uh, portal. That's the piece that's going across the top uh, horizontally. You kind of see it in the sketch to the left, and you can see it in the photo as well. Um, however, uh, pavement has built up over the years, and that vertical clearance has been reduced to 14 feet 10 inches. So, look at the picture on the bottom left there. Uh, the upper cord, that's what that is, it's in good condition. 
Um, it just needs to be cleaned and painted. Um, picture on the right is illustrating a vertical member, and all the vertical members at and below the elevation of the bridge railing are in poor condition. Um, and you can see in that picture on the left, there's a putty knife stuck into the flange of that beam. Well, that's a, that was a crack, and it went through the whole length of the flange, and it's on the other side of the web as well. So that was the, the angle that had, that's the vertical that had the emergency repair this past fall. So the lower cord is also in poor condition. You can see the picture on the left and the picture on the right. The picture on the left really shows how bad the gusset plates that help tie that bottom cord together have deteriorated. And on the right, um, it's just another picture of what kind of poor condition it's in. All right, so, um, so the fascia and the curb are in poor condition, and there's matte cracking efflorescence, efflorescence on the underside of the deck. Well, you can see in that left picture, uh, right along the edge of the pavement where the, and where the sidewalk can drag, there's curb missing there. It's rotted off, it's rotted away. And you look at the picture on the right side, there used to be a six inch curb going the whole entire length along that fascia out there and it's gone. So um, curves are important for channeling water runoff away from the steel and off the end of the bridge, uh, which is the reason why um, the lack of curves is contributing to the speed of how fast the steel is deteriorating. So uh, in this photo, you can see that the deck has extensive patching and that the expansion joint has failed and leak and is leaking. But uh, the note, I do believe the deck has been recently paved. Um, so it looks better, but it's just covering up an underlying concrete deck issue. All right, the stringer floor beams and the cross bracings, uh, lower, lower bottom cross bracing has significant section loss and there's debris collected on the floor system member along the fascia. Uh, you can see the picture on the left, you got some serious section loss on that bottom plan of the stringer. And then on the right, you get a lot of section loss with the cross bracing. And you can see a lot of dirt built up there on the, uh, the flange of the long cord. Uh, the west abutment, which is the picture on the right, is in fair condition, uh, but it needs Concrete repair work. That looks a lot worse than it is. That's more mostly cosmetic. There's nothing structural that way. Too wrong with that on the right. Uh, the east abutment is in satisfactory condition. However, and that's the picture on the left. However, it sits on old concrete that really is starting to crumble and it should be faced to shore up. Um, so here we have a picture on the left of the railing, which shows that you've got significant section loss and there's holes in the railing. And uh, that four foot 10 vertical restriction that I talked about earlier is being hit by trucks. And you can see in the picture on the right, that's one of the portals uh, and both ends of the bridge have been hit up there. So those need to be repaired. As you're coming from Montpelier uh, towards the bridge, you get decent sight distance. Coming from Northfield, it's a different story. You got a pretty good curve coming into that bridge, coming in that direction, and sight lines are limited. So that's the condition of the bridge. So I'm going to get on what are the resources that are located in the project area. Well, we don't talk about wetlands. There aren't any in the project area. Stormwater. There's no existing permits or regulatory concerns. There are no no non-native or invasive species. There aren't any identified or recorded rare and threatened endangered species in the project area either. However, the, uh, the presence of the threatened northern long-eared bat is possible even though the project area is not prime bat habitat. Uh, the project area is within a map uh, zone of riparian wildlife connectivity. There are uh, prime agricultural soils, but they're outside the project area to the, le to the west. And there is a hazardous site, uh, but it's uh, it's a known site, and it's to the east, 
outside the project limits as well. So in the picture on the left, on the right there, uh, you can see that's a railroad crossing. It's about 350 feet, 375 feet northwest of the bridge. Uh, it is likely that it is going to have uh, pit railroad pavement marking and sign updates. Uh, hydraulics on this bridge is not a concern. If you've seen, that's a deep gully underneath that bridge. Uh, we got oh, we got 12, oh, nearly 12 feet of uh, freeboard at uh, 100 year storm event. Uh, there are no archaeological sites or cultural management surveys recorded within one mile of the project area. Uh, but if you look to the right, you can, in that photo, you can see some concrete ruins down near the river. Um, that may need additional investigation if the project uh, impacts that. Uh, historic, the bridge is eligible for the National Register of Historic Places. Um, the picture there is the Berlin Dog River Natural Area. I noticed when I was out there, the sign got knocked down by a collapsing tree. And they got out there and fixed it? Yeah, not, <laughs> not yet. Not yet? Okay. Um, it, is a, it is a 4F, considered a 4F resource. Um, further historic survey may be required depending on how large the project impacts the world to be. But right now, it's not anticipated. Photo on the left, you can see all the lovely aerial uh, utilities that are in the project area. They're on, they're, they're all on the uh, downstream side. What you see there is three phase power for Green Mountain Power, and in the distance, over out kind of behind the Riverton Memorials building, there you can see a substation. Um, the right of way through the project area varies. On the east end, it's about 68 feet, and it flares out to 108 feet um, by the time you get to the west side. But um, it reduces down to the, three, the traditional three rod, third, 49 and a half foot right away as you move away from the project area. So a lot of lines on that, and I wish I had a little pointer because I point out to you, but uh, the dark line is kind of like a U shaped the upper part of that, that's kind of outlining where the uh, natural area is. Uh, just below that, on their side of the street, that dark line is an odd shape. <laughs> that's kind of, that's the archaeologically sensitive area. There's a nice square right in the middle, right where the bridge is, that's historic, and that's capturing where the uh, uh, historic truss is. Now, I don't know if you can see it, there's two, wait, maybe? No, I can't. Oh, cursor, right here. You guys see my cursor? Yeah. yeah. All right. This line right here, I should have done now. This line right here that I'm following, that's the right away line. And there's a right away line on the other side. So you can see how much it varies and flares out into most of the project area. And just off the sheet over here is where the railroad is located. If you right click, it might give you pointer options. It will give you a red. All right, I'm not too sophisticated. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, um, here's the existing profile. Uh, you can see it's coming down from the, from, uh, let's see, coming from Northfield. It's a pretty good descent right in there. There's this nice little kink in the alignment just before the bridge, right at the bridge. So, what is the design criteria that we're considering? Well, uh, the design criteria is going to be based on 3,600 vehicles per day and 5.2% trucks. The design speed is going to be 35 miles an hour, which is what it's posted for right now. Um, due to the track needs the Vermont 12 and HS25 load rating is design criteria. Uh, 11 foot lanes and three foot shoulders is the minimum required for Vermont state standards. However, we recommend 11 foot lanes with five foot shoulders. And I'll get into that later. Um, the vertical and horizontal alignments and associated sight distance are substandard. As we already discussed, the roadway width is substandard and the bridge width is also substandard. So what are the alternatives that we considered? Well, we considered the no bid, but no build. Uh, 
but doing uh, doing nothing does not meet the purpose and need, and it certainly does not address the safety or the condition concerns of the bridge. So it's not recommended. The rehabilitation option was considered. Um, it would need to be rehabbed, as I already said, to HS25 to meet the traffic needs. It would need a new deck, new expansion joints, bridge rail, entire new floor system, all new vertical members. Uh, those are the ones that are straight up and down. There's some diagonals in there. Uh, some of those are going to need to be uh, replaced or repaired. Um, the bottom cord is going to need partial replacement. And a lot of those gust plates that you saw that were certainly around, there's a lot, those are going to be needed to be replaced. Um, both abutments are going to need some concrete repair. And the whole structure is going to need to be cleaned and repainted for a 30 year design life. However, concerns regarding long term maintenance and fatigue and service life are still going to remain. The significant safety concerns for bicycles and point vehicles will still remain. The vertical height restriction and permit vehicle restrictions would still remain. So that option is not recommended either. And uh, we're recommending a reuse at a new location with a new bridge on alignment. Because that's the only alternative that addresses all the safety concerns. Bridge width, bridge railing, bicycle safety, unrestricted loading, and vertical clearance. It addresses all the maintenance concerns and service life. Um, it'll have minor improvements to the vertical and horizontal alignments. Um, not as much as we'd like as the site constraints over there, the houses nearby and everything just really make it difficult to do any real serious alignment changes there. If the truss is reused, it, it is anticipated that the traffic demands of the new location would require a reduction in the amount of truss members that would need to be replaced. Uh, however, it would still need new abutments in its new location. So there is the typical roadway section and bridge section of the proposed uh, new bridge. Um, if you look, you can see that we're uh, recommending five foot shoulders on each side of 11 foot travel lanes. As I mentioned earlier, this is a high priority uh, bicycle corridor. So using the five feet would better serve bicyclists and would accommodate pedestrians as well. Since there are currently no sidewalks at each end of the bridge, uh, this would be the most efficient use of the bridge width to accommodate bikes and pedestrians. Yeah, we talked about width quite a bit um, in our internal discussions. Uh, there is currently a sidewalk on the bridge. There's no sidewalk paths leading up to the bridge. So we were faced with the decision of putting in the 11 foot, three foot typical sections. That's two 11 foot travel lanes with three foot shoulders with a sidewalk or widen that shoulder space to a five foot shoulder, which would accommodate um, shared use of bicycles, pedestrians, um, all sort of multimodal type. And that's something that we'd like to hear from the town if the that 11 foot, five foot uh, typical section is, um, if you're in agreement with that, if a sidewalk is something that is being used and that you'd like to see on the new bridge, then we could do the reduced um, typical section. Not our recommendation, but something that we would consider so if anybody from the town wants to comment, doesn't need to be now, but we can we can bring it up uh, when we're done here. Well, a lot of us don't have mailboxes in that area, and so the only access to the mailbox is over the bridge is to walk over the bridge, and to not have a proper space to do that. I know myself; I probably wouldn't feel comfortable just walking on a shoulder, since it is 35 miles per hour, and big trucks do drive over there that having an actual space designated for pedestrian only would be something that I would prefer to see for safety. Unless we could figure out the mail and we wouldn't have to walk over the bridge. That might be an easier uh, discussion. Talk to the post office that, I don't know. <laughs> Currently the town does use it. We snow blow it ourselves so that we can go over the bridge. Yeah, I don't know how many people use the mailboxes over there, but 
I know all of our renters do. Whoever is on Route 12. So pretty much. Yeah. We got six probably least over there. They deliver all on Route 12, but they refuse to service Ayers Road. Or so, any Yeah. If the, if the area to access the mailboxes is obstructed, that's going to cause a problem. And then also the walking, like we already talked about. And it's correct. I agree with him yeah. on that if you're going to make those that new bridge that wide when that fast we need to have a place where we can feel safe people don't go we have little by. kids no. like yeah no, no they do not go there anymore. and as you can see they can't see what's down my there. concern is it is a dangerous place and you put a new bridge in there the trucks don't have to slow down to see if somebody's coming the traffic's going to go faster down through there Absolutely. with the new bridge that's that is definitely a concern Especially because live. of that intersection, that's Crosstown Road, Ayers Road, and Route 12. It's a really dangerous intersection as it is. So that should be something that's being considered in mm -hmm. this project. Is We actually kind of laid the lake where it was one lane. <laughs> we felt a little safer. <laughs> Well, well, this is a uh, John. John, stop! Can you hear, can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, um, I don't. I don't happen to walk across that bridge, that bridge um, um, much for much of anything. anything. Um, but um, I would, but I would say, say, at least, at least what you currently, currently have, have is you have some protection from, protection from um, the, traveling the traveling public, public for where where that where sidewalk, sidewalk is, um, even though even there though isn't a sidewalk leading up to it on either side. Um, if you, if you did have that, that, I would think, I would think over, the over the course of the winter, winter with the snowbanks snow banks building, you would then you would be forcing, then be forcing what, you what you don't have, don't have bicycles, bicycles using. using. You're, you're, you're asking, asking pedestrians, pedestrians to walk across, to walk across something that's closer, closer to the white to the line, line just to retrieve, just to retrieve their, their mail. mail. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you know I, I, I think I would, and I'm not a resident down there. I would rather. I would rather. I would like, I would to, like see to see a, a, a sidewalk, a sidewalk there, there, and maybe and extend maybe sidewalks, on, sidewalks either on either side. That's not really, not the, really bridge, the bridge. I get it, I get it. but but yeah. it's, just, it's just a thought. There are guardrails there to protect protect the pedestrians yeah. from the cars. If you have a sidewalk on the bridge, that rail wouldn't be there on the bridge. Yeah. So what he's saying is. The way we designed that, that there would not be a rail between the sidewalk and the travel lane. The, the rail would be on the outside of the new bridge, and then we would have the sidewalk shoulder, travel lane, travel lane shoulder. And so the bridge rails would be on the outside of the sidewalk, not the inside as it currently is. It would be a raised sidewalk. But it would be a raised sidewalk. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. And, I and I think that, that traffic, traffic will, you know, you know realize realizes that, that curve. curve. We'll, we'll, we'll be there. Be there. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I think I just, think just pedestrians, pedestrians themselves feel, feel better about, about that. that. It's very it's similar, very similar to, to maybe the bridge, what, what Nismont Player Route 14, Route 2. Yes. Yep. Mm -hmm. yep. Yeah, so something that would go along with that is there would need to be some agreement with the town for uh, maintenance of the sidewalk because it would need to be plowed during the, during the winter. Um, so just something to be aware of. Who would, but, be, who would be communicating with the town about that? Would that be something that's part the of city? your responsibility? We would communicate with the town, yet yeah, we, we, we would need to have a written agreement. Okay. So, so is, is, if I was if to I was compare, compare it to the bridge, the bridge in East Montclair, which has, which has a sidewalk, sidewalk, is there an is agreement, there an agreement that, that the town of East Montclair maintains, maintains that, that for snow for removal? Snow removal? Yes, there is. Okay, I okay. Have, yep, there is, and it's um, the town garage has a little a little bobcat or whatever it is, a little uh, sidewalk plow that they they do a pretty good job of maintaining it. Okay, thank okay, you. Thank you. Yep. Okay. Anybody else online? Questions? I think those are all great comments, and we hadn't considered the pedestrian generator from the mailbox, so that's um, really great information. Is there any, you. you guys, as, as if you're using that, do you have any safety concerns? Because the sudden rush is now. I'm scared to death that somebody's going to hit the bridge with a mirror while I'm on it. Because <laughs> I see a lot of mirrors. Well, I, I, I'm scared it's to death. Like I'm surprised you don't see mirrors littered across the bridge. Yeah. There's 
Well, I mean, you got to still cross the road to get to the mailboxes. Oh, yes. There is a safety concern with that as yeah. well. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah okay. the, the mail is, is troublesome there, to say the least. And just to get my mail is four times across the road. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, next one, this is just the layout of the proposed. Basically, it's just showing, uh, this is actually showing the wider shoulders. Uh, there's an awful lot of lines on there, so if you want to talk about that afterwards, we can get closer and talk about it. <laughs> afterwards. All right, here's the profile. Uh, it looks very much like the existing profile, but if you notice, we're able to get a little bit of a smoother entrance into the, the bridge there. That little kink right up there coming from Northville is gone. I mean, that's something, that's the minor improvement that we can do. How does that get achieved? Well, how it gets achieved. Uh, a slight grade increase, and you can actually, a little bit, and you can change the elevation, it's a new bridge. You can actually change the elevation of what, how the bridge sits a little bit, to try to make that transition better. So that wouldn't change the elevation of the 12, but it would change where the bridge itself would be Love well, it would change it a little bit. There is a smoothing, but it's going to be that change is going to be right near the bridge. Yeah. So the the Route 12 would be essentially there'd be more fill on Route 12 in order to make that transition. Yeah, we're probably talking a few inches. What you're talking sure, about is the exact way there, Yeah. Raising it. There's a spot where. Well, it comes as you can tell, we're right not chasing it all the way back very far. All that, you're we're eliminating the kink right at the bridge. So that transition is going to happen between your driveway and the end of the bridge. Yeah, I see where the guide wheels are. Yeah, I'm just wondering how that affects like the traffic flow going from Ayers Road and also Crosstown if it's going back that far too. That just has to be considered. Yep. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, one of the questions that needs to be asked is, how is uh, maintenance of traffic going to be uh, traffic going to be maintained during construction? I uh, looked at the three uh, standard options, and phase construction was easily ruled out because you can't maintain traffic on half a truss bridge for phase construction. Uh, the off-site detour is possible, but it's not recommended. And the well, most likely choice here is the temporary bridge, which is right. So the offsite detour would rely on, you know, if you do that, there'd be a lot of use of the local detours. And if you look on the, on the pink, where I got highlighted pink, that's Chandler Road. And then the yellow is, um, I think that's Cross. Rowell and then Cross Town. If anybody's driven those, you know that those roads are not suitable for, for large volumes of traffic and trucks. So the reality is the detour would have to be a, done through the interstate. Uh, and that would be a 27 mile detour and the bridge to end the bridge. Also, these offsite detours are work the best when you have a short road closure period. Uh, you want to get in and get out and having to deal with the, the truss bridge and maybe reassembling it and disassembling it there this project isn't necessarily conducive to having a short road closure uh, period, which is the reason why we're not recommending. So, uh, so on your temporary bridge, though, is that going to be durable enough to carry those trucks across? Oh, yeah. Come? Yeah. Uh, it, it, it's, it's mandatory that they meet all legal loads. So, temporary bridge. It's a, um, be a one lane, two way traffic temporary bridge with light signals because there is just not enough space to put a two lane bridge on there on either side of the bridge, upstream or downstream. Uh, the preferred location is the upstream side, uh, which is shown here. Uh, the downstream side has some utility and stability concerns. Right there on the left photo, that's the phase three power. That's going to be a significant um, utility relocation. And on the right, there's that concrete, old concrete abutment. There's some slope stability issues there as well. 
and that's right where the temperature needs to need to go. So the overall recommended scope reuse the existing truss bridge at new location and construction of a new bridge on alignment. Traffic maintained on a one lane, two way temporary bridge, 11 foot, five foot shoulders, no sidewalk. Thank you for the feedback on that. <laughs> um, 140 foot long single span bridge, steel girder with bare deck concrete, grass chested bridge railing. Uh, the abutments will be concrete cantilever step abutments on ledge. Uh, there'll be minimum improvements, like I said, on the entrance level coming from uh, Northfield. Um, and you have a 75 year design life. Uh, we expect to start the design phase process this spring with hopes to have the contract plans done by fall of 2025 so we can advertise during winter and then begin construction in 2026. So, have any questions? There is, you want to talk about the link board? <laughs> it's down here. Oh, sure. There's a link underneath that picture. Um, the town has that link, and it might have been posted on the town's website. Um, but tonight's presentation will be up at that link. It's a public facing uh, website. All future plan submissions, uh, you know, preliminary plans, final plans will all be posted on that link. Um, any future presentations given to the town on this project will be on this link. It's a public facing link for the project, basically. So questions, comments? What did you expect the total uh, total uh, time for the bridge to be down? Um, so the bridge won't be down uh, at all. We're not going to have a detour. Um, so I would say the largest impacts to traffic are going to be really when they're switching. So they're going to maintain traffic on the existing bridge while they're constructing a temporary bridge next to it. Yep. And then there's going to be some traffic impacts when they're switching traffic over from the existing to the temporary bridge. And then after traffic's on the temporary bridge, that's when they're going to deconstruct the existing bridge. They're going to construct a new bridge, and then they will take traffic from the temporary back to the new bridge. What's the total length of time you expect? It's going to be a long project. I mean, this is a pretty substantial bridge um, deconstructing the truss takes time. It's possible that they would construct the temporary bridge the fall beforehand. And um, so they could get get going right on yeah. the bridge in in April. So our typical construction schedule is April 15th to December 1st. And I would anticipate this is going to take a full construction season. And correct me if I'm wrong. It might be a year. Uh, one and a half construction seasons because you can get the new bridge in there one construction season, but you got to put in the temporary bridge or take out the temporary bridge, not in the winter. So one of one of those ends is going to fall into the fall or it'll fall into the spring of the next year. So yeah. it's probably a year and a half. And so when we have a, a situation where they put the temporary bridge in the fall ahead of time, um, we don't switch traffic over until the spring. So we wouldn't have one one way um, alternating temporary bridge during um, during, during winter. winter. It's a kind of a maintenance headache for plowing. Um, so. So where's the difference on, on the full scoping report that was provided? Uh, it's at eight months for this for this option for the full bridge replacement and six months straight for the rehabilitation of the current bridge. Now you're saying a year and a half. Where's the discrepancy there? Did the report, the scoping report, not include the temporary bridge timeline? Or they just, not, I can't remember. Speaking. Yeah, it's it's contractor means and methods too. I mean, we we have an estimation at this point in scoping um, how long it's going to take, and that eight months is just saying full construction season. Um, a contractor is probably going to say, you know, we want to get in. Uh, the fall ahead of time. And so there's, like I said, we're really early on in development right now. So we don't have a detailed construction schedule. Um, 
when would you expect to have that estimation? And would that be public information? Yeah, it's all public information. All the state records are, are public information. And I would anticipate it would be um, years from now, closer to the start of the project, that we would have a detailed construction schedule. So to, make, to be clear, the scoping report that was provided did not include the estimation for the timeline or the, or the cost of this temporary bridge? It includes the cost. So the cost of the temporary bridge is in that cost option. Um, in terms of the timeline, like I said, it's contractor means and methods. So it's actually when we get a contractor on board, they're the ones that are going to put together that detailed construction <laughs> schedule. So it's hard for us to say this is, you know, depending on what type of what type of temporary bridge they have, that that might dictate how long it's going to take for them to construct it. So it really is, it's the contractor is the one that that puts together that that construction schedule. They're going to say how long it's going but to take. You could probably provide some type of estimation or something like that based on past projects that would be that would equate to a similar project. I mean I just think that you know for us if we're providing public comment, we need all of the proper information so we can, you know, what we can do, like you said, to find a consensus to be on the same page. So I just want to make sure that the things that I'm reading and taking notes on are, you know, accurate in your, in your opinion. But it sounds like we're missing that big piece, which is going to add double the time to the project, which is going to really impact us who live right on the bridge. So if you get an update on that, you know, within the timeline that you're going to get estimations from these construction companies, that would be. Yeah, yeah, it's when we would get a, a contractor on board, we would know more about their means and methods. And so that right now we have that in the schedule for the fall of 2025 or winter of 2026. Um, it's possible, I would say there's a lot of project risks here based on the utilities that need to be moved, the right-of-way process, the historic mitigation process. So it's possible that's gonna be moved out a year. Um, I would say probably likely here, but maybe not. Uh, 2026 is when we have it in our budget, but again, there's there, this is a large project. So that could move I out a year. Say, I, I thought it was more like 2025 that we were really thinking about getting that because it is a very big safety concern <laughs> for yeah. all of us that walk it, drive it. Yeah. It is, and it's just process. It's the permitting process. It's the right-of-way process. That's really what takes time here. Um, not as much the design. Will that be... Um a better or more uh, layperson friendly version of the design of the bridge that's really hard to look at and really understand what that aesthetic would look like. Because I've seen, you know, past projects, they used, you know, some of the facade of the current bridge to, you know, make it a little more aesthetically pleasing, you know, based on the fact that it's part of the state, uh, you know, historic, you know, it's a state uh, historic site could be eligible for the National Historic Site. It'd be nice to see what, you know, what is on the table for with the aesthetic of it and preserving the historic beauty of something like this. Yeah, so what we really want to do here is we want to take this, this existing truss and, and rehab it for another location, like a, a, on a town road that doesn't need that HL93 load rating. Um, so we do want to preserve this truss, and we have some time to find a new location for it, if possible. Um, we really need to find an appropriate location for it. Um, in terms of the aesthetics of the new bridge, and Judith, I, I know you're on the call. That's our, our state historic preservation officer. I don't know if you want to chime in. Sure, we can... Um, mitigation is required whenever we adversely affect a historic resource. And because this bridge, the truss bridge from 1934 is considered historic, removal of it is considered adverse and an adverse impact 
would require mitigation. Mitigation is a pretty broad term for a lot of different um, ideas. Uh, we've, we've done different things for different projects. It all depends on the site. It depends on what's going on in the area. It depends on the bridge, perhaps its significance. Um, for a truss, we would usually do something we call, I don't really like the term, it's called dock and destroy. We document it prior to the bridge coming out. That's sort of a baseline, that's baseline mitigation. And what that what that is, is it's just documenting the bridge and, and putting together a small history of it so that we have that information once it's gone. The mitigation, uh, mitigation to reuse the bridge in another location would help offset the loss of this bridge in its original location by allowing people to see the bridge in a new context. It's, you know, it's very, it's, it's always important for historic resources to keep them in their original context. But when we can't, in a situation like with a bridge, we, we still have the bridge, which is significant for its engineering. And so that's, that's really what we'd be preserving is this opportunity for people to see the engineering. So if we can find a new location for it, it would be ideal. But we can also talk about the aesthetics of the new bridge as part of that mitigation. We're mostly concerned about the aesthetics of replacing a historic bridge when it's in a historic district, trying to make sure that whatever we're planning um, doesn't negatively impact that surrounding history. We don't have a historic district here. We do have um, the historic bridge though, and what I'm hearing is interest in making sure that there's a, perhaps a railing that, uh, that could be considered aesthetic. We wouldn't put just like, you know, simple W beam across the bridge. We, we would probably put something a little bit more decorative. Our hands are a little tied when it comes to decorations just because, or decorative features, just because we have to, meet uh, crash ratings. And we have a limited number, really kind of a limited number of railing designs that we can go with. And, um, you know, but that is something that we can keep in mind. And as, as the project moves forward through the design phases, we can look at perhaps a couple of different railing designs and talk to the town about, about those opportunities. Thank you. Cheers. Is it similar to the bridge loose pop there? The design. So we haven't gotten into the design yet. Um, so it's hard to say, but the East Montpelier Bridge that was a historic bridge, and so that railing that is there now is a is a historic railing that I believe would be um, I believe it would meet the crash test levels here. Um, I think that's the concrete. The combo concrete. I, it, I don't rail. think it has. I don't think it has the steel on top. I think it's just concrete. <laughs> it is. It's just concrete. And the reason that one was chosen was because that is a historic district, and it that's more in keeping with what is surrounding in that area. The concrete bridges are from a specific era, early 1900s, and when we install a, a bridge with a new concrete railing, it's often to sort of uh, stick with that aesthetic. You know, we don't have that that very decorative uh, feature here on this bridge. It is more utilitarian, but um, I don't know that I would recommend a, a concrete railing here, but I think there are plenty of uh, other, well, we can certainly look at some ideas, but there are also uh, metal railings that can be decorative and, and, and attractive too. I think there, I think there will be some some uh, different options out there. Yeah, Good I, would, I would be really concerned about putting in a concrete railing such as the one at East Montpelier, just because it is so tall, and we want to make sure that we have a tall railing um, for bicycle traffic. And I think sight distance issues, especially turning sure. from from Ayers and um, just the existing sight distance issues that are there, um, would be made worse with a concrete railing. Combo. But combo rail is possible, yeah. And you can um, you, you can put a you can use concrete form liners for the bottom part of it and stay in the bottom too. I mean that's still that's a relatively um, 
affordable. It's almost sort of an aesthetic thing, but I mean, there's a limitation. I mean, you can't put a nice big covered bridge on top of it. That's just way too expensive, way too much maintenance involved. Absolutely. But there are little things that can be done to make it to make the standard vanilla kind of bridge a little bit better. Yeah, I, mean, I think that would be appreciated. You know, yeah. we're looking at this, you know, beautiful historic trust bridge. And, you know, it seems like the decision really has been made to, to fully replace it. And, you know, speaking as a resident that's in Riverton and, you know, it has a really nice feel to it. And, you know, we're looking at not just like brass tacks and costs, looking at posterity and, you know, people who are, living here currently in the state, but also people who are coming to to move to our areas and, you know, pay pay taxes and kids that are going to our schools and, you know, all the things that are that are happening in the area that are really great, you know, to take away something that's that's makes Riverton so special. It would be nice to see that um, that some aesthetic qualities were taken to, to in taken into consideration uh, with the replacement. Sure. Those are things that would be kind of ironed out during the design phase, anyways. And and I, I agree with you. You know, losing losing a, a historic trust is, is it can be. You know, a lot of people really like them, and this is a this is a lovely one. It's a lighter one. It, it um, you know it, it had a, a, a it, it's significant here. Its significance in this location is 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 obvious, and losing it, I, I can understand how that might be. Um, you know, difficult for some people. We we do try to keep them whenever we can. And actually, the the regulations. One of the regulations that we have to review this project under Section 4F requires us to keep it if it's at all feasible. You know, based on the engineering, the condition, it's just not feasible. And you know, that's that's my job is to make sure we're you know if we're going to remove something like this that's historic that we we really have to and. And then to figure out the mitigation, and which would include making sure that the town has a nice replacement for it. Are you folks going to be? When's it? When you think you'll be coming back to the board? So our next step is to start on conceptual plans, and then once conceptual plans are complete. A copy of that, a copy of the plans would be sent to the town if the town would like another meeting at that point. Um, then that would be an, that that would be a good a good time to meet again. Um, so I don't know exactly when conceptual plan submission is on the schedule, but I'm I would say within six months. Any other questions for the folks from AOT? I I have a, a question. I don't know if you guys could actually answer this. So um, a while back, we had an emergency closure and then down to one lane for a period of time. Um, it's currently rated as a six, which is satisfactory. I, I can see with your report. Um, between now and replacement, is, is there a chance that we might go through such a phase again? Yeah, so that that six rating that was from the V-Trans bridge inspection at uh, the bridge inspectors the last time they came through and inspected it. Um, we had a, a Hoyle Tanner inspected this when the project was programmed and they were able to access different areas of the bridge and that six rating, um, I would say, was no longer applicable after that. Um, it's possible that the bridge inspectors would go out and find something. And if that's the case, um, if there, there will be another kind of short term maintenance fix for it. So the answer to your question is yes, we could run into that again, which is the reason why we want to keep things rolling and minimize that chance. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Coming. Thank you, and thank you for your thank folks you. coming and for your opinions and involvement. Yep. Thank you. Uh, you can just yeah. keep in touch with Ben. Okay. He'll keep up. Uh, yeah. I was thinking it would be great if you want a good point.
plan first of all the different types of railing and people take a vote. Thank you very much. Can you get these folks um, email addresses? Oh, yeah, they're, yeah. These, the, no, no, the, the residents, yeah, yeah, I, I can follow up. Yeah, they're all, they're all from over in Riverton, so yeah, I can. Okay, I'll make a note. Um, senior center request for funding. Thank you both. Hi, good evening. Good evening. There is a letter in your package that we received just recently from them as well. Sorry, uh, sorry, Sarah. Just wanted to make sure they were okay. there's a yep. letter in the back, but that they have the letter in their package. Yes, Looks thank like. you. I got it. Okay. So I'm Sarah Lipton. I'm the director at the Montpelier Senior Activity Center. I'm still somewhat new. Um, very happy to be there and working with Kelly Murphy, who's our new assistant city manager for the city of Montpelier. Um, we, as you are probably aware, um, we have had many years of support from the town of Berlin, specifically because we serve Meals on Wheels to your community. In the past year, our meals have increased, not only have people needed more meals, but we've been able to serve more meals. Um, the, it's, I think around the country, there's been a, a huge intake of more need for Meals on Wheels. Thank you. Um, the pandemic really helped bring that on and also just everything else going on in our, our state of the world at this point. So we've increased um, over the last year to about 24 meals, uh, sorry, 24 recipients within the, the town of Berlin. Um, and we last year served about 6,700 meals to your residents. We also, of course, have tons of classes and programs and other events that your residents come to at the Senior Center. And due to an unfortunate confluence of events, in part me being new to the process, getting sick in the middle of the process, and not having quite all of the helpers that I needed, um, we wound up missing our deadline to get our petition into you. Um, we could, however, have probably, if we had figured out the right timing of things, been able to at least ask for level funding, which we received this past year at $20,000. Um, not being on the books with you for FY24 is going to cause us some real challenges, and we're not sure we'll be able to continue to serve those needed meals to your residents. And so that's why I'm here is to really say, you know, first of all, apologies for missing the process. And also, is there any way to consider some sort of either level funding or some funding in lieu of level funding for FY24? Because we really, we really value being able to serve your residents. And we know that we missed the process in the timeline that it was needed, but at the same time have a lot we can offer to your residents. Did you hear back? Any did you hear back from Middlesex at all? Yes, I'm actually speaking to their select board tomorrow. <laughs> so, yeah. Have, uh, they haven't they haven't figured some way to do this. Well, yeah, we're meeting tomorrow, so I'm not sure um, what it says on their agenda is um, action possible. <laughs> Yeah. So I, I'm the second uh, agenda item for their agenda. Um, and they understand also that we serve some of their residents Meals on Wheels as well as their residents in members of their town being um, members of MSAC and all of the different options and op um, opportunities available to them. So I'm just trying to go over in my head what's involved. Um, basically, we'd have to take and warn a special town meeting to vote this through. Um, the other thing is because I, I want to say our, our um, policy 
on uh, people coming in for appropriations, I almost think you have to go for a uh, for your hundred signatures for the petition because if you didn't get funded last time, is that right, Tor? I think that's right. You'd have, they'd have to go and get a petition for next year if we were to have a special town meeting. So that'd be for this year. Well, I think it. Uh, to me, as long as it's level funded. Yeah, but they missed the uh, they missed the uh, the filing for last year for this year for this year. So so a special town meeting would take the place of that. Is my is my understanding. If I if I if I might um, just offer sure. a little bit of clarity. Um, hi, Kelly Murphy, Assistant City Manager. Uh, I think. What we're seeking is not a special um, meeting, town meeting. Um, I think we were hoping that you might consider the request and see if there was any way that you might be able to um, fund the senior center through discretionary funds. And I realize that funds are super tight. We get it. Um, and we also realize that, you know, we definitely missed the mark on getting um, the petition in. Uh, but we also just wanted to approach you and see if maybe there was something that you know, we might be able to work out because um, not having funding in 24 would be a hardship. And then it also would be really hard to make up in the next fiscal cycle. Um, and so that's what we're kind of seeking is to see if there's any way that you might have funding within um, your 24 budget that you could shift around. If not, um, you know, we understand, but we also just wanted to kind of come to you today and um, let you know where we were at, and then also just kind of sort of um, provide the narrative of, of, you know, what could potentially be if we don't have funding because we can't support um, the residents of Berlin, which is not something that we really would like to do. We'd like to try to work something out if it's possible. Well, well fortunately, our treasurer is here. <laughs> Well, but we don't have any discretionary funding. I was, I was, I'm not an expert, expert on this year's budget, or you know, the next year's budget, but I wouldn't think we'd really have any discretionary. We didn't build any. Especially, yeah, especially especially that amount. Yeah. Um, now, if I now, so, so I ask Vince. Um, now, it's my understanding that diversion also wasn't included. And the Civic Center and Green Mountain Transit. Any word from those agencies? I thought Green Mountain came in. There were there were a couple that uh, did not uh, come in this year, requesting the funds. You, you are correct there. Yeah, there were a handful. As I my understanding, with diversion, here it, it's a lot smaller amount, but it, it was. Yeah, it was yeah. um, here again, they just kind of missed the deadline. Yeah. Um, so I mean, if if we were, well, I just throwing all the wrench in the in the works. If we were to have a special town meeting for the senior center, would we open it up to these other That's the question. entities as well? Well, and if so, would they, you know, here again, would they want to participate in, uh, I guess, the cost sharing? Well, my view would be, um, the senior center has come to the to us uh, seeking, seeking funding for a, for a, a worthy cause, um, I would take and put it out there, but I would not go and solicit their uh, funding. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing is, is that we may have some other things we could put on the agenda for the, if we do have a special town meeting. So, but I think one of the things we have to do, we can't do it tonight, of course, but we need to take and get a hold of Rachel and get an idea of what it would cost to have a special town meeting and get a, a little bit firmer number. Mm -hmm. But it, to me, it makes more sense if we have more than one item. Yeah. Right. So. Hey, Brad. Just a can I offer just one other sort of perspective too? Um, in terms of the Meals on Wheels recipients, the 24 folks that we currently serve, um, I think the real pickle that we face is that 
we we can't subsidize that entirely. We receive three dollars and eighty cents per meal from the Council on Aging through our contract for those meals. The meals actually cost us about fourteen dollars to produce. And we, if we do not get funding from you, then we will have to see if we can make a some kind of an arrangement with the city of Barrie and if they're able to offer those meals to your residents. But um, it really puts us in a bind of, of being <laughs> kind of forced to say, sorry, residents who we've been serving, yeah. we can't serve you these meals anymore. So I think that that's really, um, obviously it's on us for missing the deadline, but that's why we're reaching out. It's not just for some sort of good idea of serving the senior center. It's really that we we really do serve vital meals and, and wellness checks for your residents. And of course, there's all the other perks of being a member um, with all of our classes and everything else. But it's really the meals that that hurt <laughs> the most what, for us. What, what's your timeline? Um, well, our fiscal year ends at the end of June. And so we, um, I believe we, I don't know if we've received it yet, but I know we we are on the docket to receive FY23 funding from you for 23,000 uh, for 20,000. Um, so it really would be uh, July 1st would have to be the cutoff date. So we'd have to look at what would cost, I mean, the uh, timeline. Would cover. Yeah, we'd, uh, we'd have to see the timeline for uh, to warn a uh, meeting. Yeah. Brad? Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm just waiting for a good time to kick in here. Um, hey, Sarah and Kelly, I, I don't think the, the select board um, is is going to really, they're going to hold anything up. I think this is going to really work, but we're just trying to figure out how to bring the town in. And so now I'm going to say, um, uh, Tour, I, I kind of agree with you. I don't necessarily think, uh, I think that, um, I guess, special town meeting, if you want to call it, would take the place of anyone having to go out and get signatures. So for, for the same amount, for, for the same, for, for the for same amount. Level. See, I can't, for the life of me, I cannot remember the, the wording of that, um, that uh, policy. So I have to take a look that up. Um, yeah, we've got, we've got time before June. So but our next town, our actual election of anything is going to be next town meeting in March. Is this correct? Yeah. Is, there's nothing coming up in the fall. Okay. Um, so I think, uh, <laughs> Brad, you're right. We need a few things extra to bring people out. Yeah. If, because you're not going to, you're not going to have a special election without it costing. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and, and, the, and the more people that are there, the, uh, it's, it spreads it out a little bit. Um, you know, and it sounds, you know, just by the numbers, it's 24 people, but 24 people um, rely on this. And, yes, 24 and, people rely on this, and it is it is about 6,700, 6, 6,700 meals a year, because most of those recipients receive seven meals a week. Yeah. Well, the, other, the other important thing is the wellness checks. Yeah. That, that's, that's actually a really huge bonus. part of it. Our drivers, so our drivers go out four days a week and they are on it every time. And I've, I've delivered a lot of meals myself and I've actually done those wellness checks. I've called the police when I couldn't get a resident at home before that happened over the holidays. Um, and that's a really key piece of this. So many of the residents that we serve in your community are very rural and they don't necessarily have someone that's checking on them other than their delivery driver. So that is really another really key component of Meals on Wheels. So if we took that money, I'm now gonna ask the question to Sarah. Um, if we took that money that you would have received um, and we, we broke it down by month, I'm just saying if we didn't have a special election until let's just say November, September, November, after July 1st, um, what, what would that be? And then between now and some, our next select board meeting or whenever the select board could decide or Diane allow, what could we put forward until that actual election happens to subsidize it for those couple of months? 
or well, would the just, select board even consider it? Uh, well, I'm just throwing well, it out there. There's some legalities here. We. Yeah, I, I guess one question with that is then we'd have to reprint new tax bills. Yeah. If if we do it after the summertime, you know, when the tax bills okay. go out. Right. Well, I think that's kind of our, our biggest um, time, I don't say time crunch, but um, time frame that we're looking at right now, you know, is it real like to have this done by middle of June, I guess, to, to, yeah. to set the tax rate and everything to have the tax bills go out. Yeah. Um, Any time after that, then we're talking about reprinting new tax bills and the whole, uh, <laughs> the whole uh, yeah, I mean, so many automatic payments and stuff would really, yeah. yeah. Would really be a mess. And we promise never to do this to you again. <laughs> <laughs> well, if I may ask just to change the subject a little bit, um, what are you going to do to make sure this doesn't happen again? Yep. Already, I actually, just today, I, I got a... a can look up her name if you want, um, a volunteer from your community who is going to get the signatures needed on time. So I think her name is Marta. Um, I don't have it written down in front of me, but um, she actually called the center today and said, please, please, can I get your signatures for you? Um, the materials that we write for you, that's easy. We already, that's, that's not the problem. We already had that all done. It was really just a matter of getting signatures in time. Um, and the other thing that, that sort of complicated the works for my process was, again, being new to the process and not realizing when I was drafting all the materials that we would be required by the city of Montpelier to ask for an increase, which was what then put us in the position of needing signatures. And so that all happened a little bit too late for me to be able then to find a volunteer. So that's all going to be avoided in the future. Okay. Um, I know it doesn't really help with things tonight, but, and not necessarily help you, but in the past, I would always look at the town meeting warning and compare it to the previous year's warning. Because we had this issue about 10 years ago. I don't know if you remember, Brad. I think it was adult basic education or something. Somebody they did change, submit. They changed uh, the women, women's, women's shelter to circle, I think. And then well, that was another one, yeah. And, um, but you know, one didn't come through, and we didn't catch it. Well, we didn't. We never did catch it. We didn't find out about it until much later in the process. The, the tax bills had already gone out, and the fact the organization was looking for their check, yeah. and it never came. So that kind of made me, I guess, hyper aware at that time. Like I said, this was ten years ago. You know, so I would always look at the proposed warning versus the previous, and make sure we knew positively that each organization was in fact on the new warning or we knew definitively that they were not asking for money next year. So I, I put that out that I will do that again next year. It doesn't really help us tonight. But another thought I had, and it's just a thought, and would a, and I don't want to make a whole lot of work for the town administrator or the town clerk, and actually, yes, I do, but um, is would an email <laughs> reminder be helpful or would that just get lost in all the noise? Would, would an email like in maybe December saying, hey, just a reminder, town meetings are coming up. If you're looking for a petition, they must be turned in by this date or if you're looking for federal, for, for um, level funding, you must make your request by this date. Would that be helpful or would that just get lost? I mean, it's helpful for sure. And I've also um, now planned everything out by your timeline. So um, as I mentioned, we'll be on it next year okay. <laughs> and every year after. Well, I'm, I'm a big uh, process and procedures guy. That's, mm -hmm. that's sure. what makes me comfortable. And not just fixing your issue tonight, but how can we try to mm -hmm. prevent this from occurring in the future. Well, so, you know, just um, speaking yeah. from a person who's been through this for the first time and messed up, uh, for anyone else that's new next year, it would be lovely for them to get a reminder. <laughs> so that is a nice idea for uh, from a process perspective. Okay, we'll take a look at that. Well, I, I mean, I, I propose we'll take a look at it at some point in the, in the future. We got some time, but. Yeah. 
you don't have to, we don't have to uh, figure that one out tonight. But if if you could um, after your meeting tomorrow with Middlesex, get a hold of Vince and see if they have any insight in this little problem. Yeah, sure, uh, absolutely. Um, I can certainly circle back to you all. Um, what's the best way to do that? Just the email communication that I had going earlier today, or? Yeah, Sarah, you just the, just you can email me specifically. Okay, great, perfect. Yeah, I'll be happy to share that. Great, thank you. Yeah. So we'll see what we can do. Um, thank you. Uh, any questions for us? Any other questions? Any questions for them? I think my, you know, listening to this the challenging process, um, I'm wondering, is there anything we can do to help? Um, you know, we could probably, we just did a big um, uh, fundraiser over the weekend for our feast program. Um, and we're accustomed to doing events. We could put on, you know, some kind of low, low bar meal for the town of Berlin, if that was helpful, or, you know, just sort of something to showcase what we offer and why it's so important. We could do a presentation, we could bring some of our um, Meals on Wheels drivers in to talk about what they do and why it's important. We could bring in some of our recipients if they'd be willing to talk. I mean, you know, if, if something like that was helpful, I think our community would be really, really all for sharing. So, you know, just let me know about that. and and any other thing that we could do to help. I really apologize and appreciate how complicated this is and makes more work for you all, which I really don't feel good about. So sorry about that. And, and let me know if there's, you know, what we can do to support the process and really just thank you so much for considering and, and allowing us to even be here and considering this uh, challenge that we're facing. Well, okay then. Um... Once we take and figure out what the legalities of it is from our side, we'll let you know. Okay. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you all very thank much. You, Sarah. Thank you. I, I just want to thank reiterate, you, reiterate that, you know, everybody here is, you know, 100% support of the Senior Center and the Meals on Wheels. It's just a matter of finding out the process of, of getting this accomplished. I understand. Thank you so much. My advisory council will be happy to hear that tomorrow when I report to them. <laughs> and I'll circle back after my meeting with Middlesex. <laughs> okay, thank, thank you. you all so Thanks, much. Sarah. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Kelly. Thanks very much. Yeah. Okay, audit revolt to the board. Okay. Thank you. You have nice. the floor. Yeah. I think I'll sit over here. That way I can pull my things out. I've given documents to There's two of them. There's one. I also did send the, the draft report to you. Yeah, there's, there's more than more yeah. than two documents. There's a draft in there. There's that top document that you have is the one that she'll be probably reviewing first. Yeah. Um, the other is just additional information to support that. Okay, and plus I sent you the whole draft as well through an email this weekend. Okay, so what I wanted to do on Schedule D, which is a copy that I that I gave to you, that one right there is a statement of revenues and expenditures, and it just does everything as a whole. It's just a one page, so it's, uh, Exhibit D. Okay, so on that, so I think that's easier to explain that way. I mean, I could certainly go through everything one by one, but I don't think you probably want me to do that at this, at this point in time. So what I wanted to do was bring out the things that were relative. Now, obviously, um, we had a lot of expenditures mm -hmm. in FY22, and 400 and about 50,000 that we were expecting because we paid down a lot of our debt. Okay, we paid off all of our vehicles, basically. Um, and we had a lot of projects going on. So um, a couple of highlights as far as we made a little bit more money. Uh, there was an increase in the town clerk revenue of about 26,000. And that's because so many houses were selling. So things were really, you know, really hopping. And of course the documentation for that to charge us for. The other increase was in the pilot. We got $54,000 more than we were anticipating. So those things were good adding up to about 80,000 for that. Now where our expenditures were that were more than anticipated. The first one was in the town admin wages. And some of that had to do with the town clerk. Now in FY21, we said the town clerk in FY22 um, was going to get a raise, but that was not in the budget. So we had to make up that difference, which is like about 8,000. Then for the assistant town clerk, we said, well, she could go full-time. And so that was the difference. That was like probably 13 to 14,000. So that added up. Uh, and also, because we increased our wages, 
there was more as far as pension and taxes. And then the part-time person got onto a health insurance, which that alone is like 10,000. Okay, so those were some things happening there. Also myself and um, I know the assisted town administrator had a lot of overtime for the projects he was working on, but I did have a lot of special projects last time um, in FY22, one of them being the biggest one probably was the culvert. There was a lot of paperwork to do for that. And then we were finishing up um, Paint Turnpike North or Paint Turnpike South. There was a lot of paperwork with that and then all the new grants that we had. So I did put in more um, overtime that I'm putting in now, obviously, but that was because of those projects. So all in all, we were looking for an increase of 50,840 with all of that going on. I mean, excuse me, 43,900. No, I'm wrong, 50,840. Admin expense now I'm going to, and that's a 43,9. So we ended up spending $10,000 more for computer support. We had the money for the new server because we had that in a reserve. That was like 17,300. But we had the server from before that was not working. We're constantly getting patches on it and then building all of what we needed to put the new server in. Okay, so that was an additional cost of 10,000. Uh, we got a new web page that we had anticipated would be 1500. That was an additional 3500. But our web page is pretty strong now, and it's and we're still with the same company, and we are just growing in that respect. And more people have access, and the information is better on the website. Um, and then it was $6,300 for wiring because we changed a lot of the wiring here, took some of the old wiring out, uh, and also we had a door that we had to replace for the police department. And so that was about $6,300. Then legal fees, we did not, I did not anticipate enough for the union contract for the police department. So there's $17,000 more there. Okay, and then in abatements, uh, we had $7,100 more. Part of that was a Grange and then another issue was with Vecto and we had to take care of that. Okay, so that was the increase on that. Off the police department, that was an increase of 86,300, and that had everything to do with overtime. We were short staffed. We had people at the academy. Uh, we just had the worst of uh, times for that because people were still getting COVID. So it really was the perfect storm, unfortunately. And part of that also was a new union contract because I did not anticipate uh, what the new un union contract would be for an increase. So like I said, that's 86,300 for that. The highway department, however, had a surplus of 79,200, which was good. Uh, now the increase in the capital budget, that was significant. And part of it was paying off the equipment debt. However, uh, another piece of that was the culvert. The culvert cost us more than we anticipated. When we were planning this, I remember there was a time when uh, the engineers discovered that there was um, shale or something that was not anticipated, and that was a $30,000 increase we were not anticipating. And then on top of that, they had not planned for the paving afterwards, and that was like another at least 10, 15,000. So all in all, with our, in our losses, we had a loss of 727,873, which was significant. We were not anticipating it to be that much. We were anticipating more to be the 400, 450,000 era. But a lot of it is the culvert. And a lot of it is just the expense that we have with the police department that was not anticipated. So what that did to our undesignated funds, I just want to, I do have that marked off in here. And now I'll tell you what it brought us down to. Had it marked off in here. I know our undesignated funds is like down to a little over 900,000, okay? And we have pledged 450,000 to that. So I think we're still in good standing. Uh, as, and I think right now, uh, when I was looking at where we stand on our budget for FY23, I think we're right about where we should be. But I am gonna discuss that in the next meeting that we have in April. So we'll understand where we are right now. I just wanted to you know, go over the audit so that you would understand where we're coming from, why we had the loss. And, and Diane, mm -hmm. of the undesignated funds being mm -hmm. down to 900,000, how much did you say you have pledged to it? 450,000 for FY23. Thank you. Yeah. 
So that is the pluses and the minuses and just, you know, really broad. If you've got any other questions on it, please let me know. I can certainly go, you know, dive into it for you. The breakdown is extremely helpful. Yeah, mm -hmm. and but I can certainly go even further. I just thought it would just take all night for to go line by line, mm -hmm. it would not help. It's unfortunate, like with the con uh, culvert con costs, everything's so expensive especially it, for things yeah that, that was that another nature. piece too that uh they didn't anticipate the mm -hmm. full cost but then when they ran into problems right. that made things even worse exacerbated it yeah but but we had to have it obviously it was right. not like a want it was a need right so we you were anticipated to have uh to have uh, about 400000 in the rainy day fund. Everything is said and done. Yes, a little more than that, yeah. Okay. So I think we're still in good shape. Um, and I've, so far, you know, cross my fingers, uh, FY23 is, is looking pretty good. But, you know, obviously that could change yeah. as well. But we will, I will discuss that at the next meeting Great. and update you on that. Great. Any other questions for Diane? I just want to say the updates are very helpful. Very helpful. Uh, any questions, just email me. I'll dive into it. Okay, well, thank you, Diane. Thank you. I'm still sitting here because I'm up next again. <laughs> uh, let's see here. Uh, audit results to the board and the Economic Development Committee update and approval for funds? Yes. Okay, so I did send you the minutes, and I think they're included in here as well. Yeah, they're in the package. Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay, so a couple of things I wanted just to point out is um, we've had really good discussions. We've had two meetings so far. We're going to have another meeting on Wednesday. Uh, and, of course, we were talking about uh, replacement of the building or what we're going to do with this building and we're looking, you know, ahead into the future. So what um, Wayne Lamberton suggested, we all did agree, is he was saying we need to get like a planner that can help us because obviously we can say, OK, well, we have to need, we need a police department. We need this. We need that. We have no idea how much that's going to cost. and We don't really know is how much space do we need. So uh, the, the plan is to if we get a planner, who could sit down with the town people, uh, you know, I'm talking to the employees here, uh, and tell us how much square feet each department needs um, and, what, and what they feel they need for space. Um, then after that, somebody could plan it for us and help us with it. And where Lane, Wayne says, he says, I know a lot about this stuff, he said, but I always hire somebody to help me through this. Um, so we're looking at this planner and we're saying, he's saying, well, it's going to cost probably about $3,000 to pump with a plan. They're not going to have sketchers or drawings or anything like that. They're going to have something written up saying, okay, we think that the police department is going to need this or another department is going to need something else and give us options. And that way we can, then we can present that to you. However, we've got $1,500 in reserve and we're looking at $3,000. And I don't know where else I could get money from the reserves for that other 1500 So that's the issue. And unfortunately, we can't really move forward with anything else on this unless we can get somebody to help us plan. So we're just looking to the board to what are you, you what will you advise us? And also with this planner, uh, there would be the understanding that there's no obligation for the town to do anything with them. In other words, if they say, you know, you have to build this and this, and, you know, can we bid this? No, we're right now, this is just strictly talking what we need. I guess cookie sales up. <laughs> exactly. And I do see where Pat asked if we needed an RFP and that this project should be under 5,000. So should not be required to send out RFPs. Right. And Wayne said we are looking for a space plan, not blueprint prints or pictures. Right. And about six hours of work for the planner at 200 per hour. That's where we came up with that calculation. So we got 1,500 available in, in reserves. this year's? Yeah, in the reserve. 
Oh, yes. reserve. We've been carrying that for a long time, like 15, 15, actually. And is there anything in the current year budget? No. And nothing in the next year budget? No. Um, could our funds be used for this purpose? What 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 is in the building maintenance fund? I we cleaned that out last year because with a wall replacement, I took all that money. When we had that wall replaced in this town clerk's office, mm -hmm. the insurance was not enough. Gotcha. So we had to use that money. What will, what will be the the monies put back into that fund in uh, July? I'd have to look. At the top of my head, I'm seven thousand. I have to look. I can't even. I can't even make it an, an educated guess uh, on that one. It almost seems like it's the building fund was. It's kind of a repeating amount, similar yeah. to what we do with. I didn't want to say year it. question to her in, in next year's budget. We'll come up with a number, uh, like we do conservation commission and so on, to propose to go into the. Economic Development Committee budget as well. I don't know what that number will be yet, but there will be a number that of some some amount that we will include in the budget. We just restarted them. Um, that 1500 is what was there from previous committee. Um, so there was nothing at the time during budgeting um, even thought about to put in there. No. Other than that 15 that was already there. What's the committee's timeline on this 3000 for the planner? Well, uh, we would we would love to be able to get this going right now because uh, if if we don't, then we'll have to go into a different topic because we can't go any further because we, you know, we can't come up with money. We can, in other words, we can't come up with how much it's going to cost. We're just that's not we're not qualified to do that. Yeah. Not not one of us. Uh, we do have in the reserve that we put in there um, in FY twenty two. We do have twelve thousand planning reserve. Now I know that the planning. Uh, committee had you know they wanted to use it for um, the town center that you know this actually potentially could be a town center type situation as well yeah. it's a good point yeah and there is 12,000 available there. Mm -hmm. and it's a small Are amount of the 12,000 right. available like 1500 basically yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. You know, I'm okay. hoping it doesn't go over 3,000 right. if it does I'll come back are they um, do they have that twelve thousand committed to no or is it basically just setting aside for we set it aside, yeah, for um for anything to do town center stuff, yeah. But we also have money in the budget for town center. But we do have two projects going on right now that are gonna be completed you know, by twenty three. Mm -hmm. That will probably, I don't think it'll touch this, the 12,000, but it will, it will probably eat up most of what they have for FY23 in the budget, which is like, I think 40,000. So basically, other than using ARPA funds, the only money in the, in the budget that you tap into is that 12,000. Um, yeah, that's it. And it, it is for planning. Yeah, it's the select board that makes the choice on where that's going to be spent. So. Mm -hmm. But I just don't see any other categories that, yeah. you know, that match that at all. Any thoughts? I'm inclined and um, I'll put it on the table. I make the motion to approve the use of $3,000 from the planning reserves, up to $3,000 from the planning reserves for the purpose of a planner um, for up to six hours of work at approximately 200 an hour yeah, estimation. They, are, they already have 1,500. In, we do have 1,500 in the, in the mm -hmm. economic. Okay, so you're saying in addition, up to 3,000 from there. Okay. I was thinking up to 3,000 from the planning reserves without using the 1,500. That's my motion. I'll second it. Any further discussion? And then you're not looking at using the ARPA funds or anything? Or the board funds. The board. Not the okay. board funds. Right? Any other discussion on this? Those in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion carries.
Anything else, Diane? Uh, no, not All unless set. I'll bring it to the board on Wednesday, and I, and I think I'll talk about it again at the next meeting that we have here. Yep. Thank you, Diane. Uh, let's see here. Uh, final approval to proceed with the COT systems. Yes. Contact for record. So for, for the third go around of this one, <laughs> third approval. Um, in your document, in your folder, there's a document that starts with this. Mm -hmm. I included it that shows, it's just a summary of the two, two costs, right, for this project, which again, we've already approved the, the ARPA funds for. Uh, but just to give you the details one more time, right, uh, the record room schedule is, uh, is the first one on your list in section three. It's 7450 dollars and total plus two hundred and ten dollars a month for the service fee this gives you the details again about that um, and then the the second one which is the bigger one this is the the whole scanning of the vault the records from um uh, up to 198 from 1980 to present so the 40-year requirement right um that needs to be done on site and so on that we talked about that cost um, the total is $61,305, um, and that's based on estimated unit fees um, as described in, in this document as well. And then uh, $20 a month uh, support and such going forward. So what that will do will give us the ability to be online for the 40-year record research, and, and that will be set up in such a way through this that we also still collect the funds as if they had come in and used the vault and made copies and so on. Um, we'll, we'll still capture that income from this as well, but people will be able to do it from online now, um, as well as come into the vault. And those records will all be done. Everything prior to the 40 years and everything current going forward after the 40 years, the staff is gonna start doing, they'll be trained uh, to be able to do that to, to do everything prior to that and get it recorded and electronically and online and everything going forward. Um, so there won't be any additional costs beyond that as well. How are you going to be able to rectify the, the charges or our fees for access to the records digitally and uh, people using credit cards? That will have to be set up at the time when we set up the software. That will be set up. There'll be a link on within this uh, software setup to manage that. So, if a, say if a record, if a record an attorney wants to go online, he'll yeah. go onto the site. He'll log in. When he goes to print, he'll have to put in the credentials to, to pay for it to receive that back through. Yeah, but what I'm, what I'm saying is, is that if there's a fee for the credit card. Are we going to take and have uh, two fee schedules, one for cash and one for card, or? Well, the credit card fee will have to be included. Again, that'll be, there'll be a note online that when they start the process, yeah. similar to what we have now. It should be. That, that says yeah. okay. you're gonna be charged whatever, 3%. So yeah. three cents. So, I mean, if it was a $20 fee, you'd get a 60 cent credit card, card fee. fee. Right. Yeah. They would, yeah, and we get the twenty dollars. Yeah. Yeah. I yeah, I'm not exactly certain how that one works, but that's what that's how it works for the taxes and yeah. I like to think we can make it work the same way for the that we don't absorb those fees. Okay, yeah. correct. That's correct. We won't we won't be absorbing those fees. Those will be included in that. So and there will also be a workstation because we saved the latest workstation, the most updated one that we had when we did the computer set. There'll be a workstation set up here in the building as well. So if somebody doesn't have access but doesn't want to go into the vault, if they got concerns about whatever, they can come in here and they'll be able to do it from here online as well. So that'll be set up for people to come in and use. In terms of the staff to be trained pr prior to going forward, um, if there were staff turnover, would our staff then train others, or would it be ability. built in for additional training the, for new staff? We'll have the ability here to, to train on it. Excellent. Thank you. So are you looking for another motion on this? 
I, I, in my opinion, I think it's been approved twice. This is just to make sure because there was some confusion around it previously. Okay. Uh, I think it would be great. Uh, that'll make it clean and no more question about it at, at that point. So what's the total dollar number here? Oh, you're going to make me do math now. Mm -hmm. I believe it's the 61,305. Is that no, correct? No, that's no? just for one portion. It's the 61,305 and the 7450, the 210 and 210, $210 a month and $20 a month. 230 a month? Yeah. Okay. So 68,755 is for the digitization in the program itself. Yeah, 68,755. Okay. And then you said 230 a month. 230 a month thereafter. Okay. That's everything for, for the COTS system. So that'd be like 2760 a year. And it's 2760 a year for how many years is it anticipated? I think that would be. It's recurring. Years. It's yeah, recurring every year. Um, but our contract was for, I don't want to misquote it. Uh, project management and service installations are included, assumptions and requirements. Sixty months. Sixty month term. Five yes. years. Okay. I make the motion to approve sixty-eight thousand seven hundred and fifty-five dollars toward the digitization and programming fees for the COT systems, along with two hundred and thirty dollars per month and two thousand seven hundred and sixty dollars a year, which is recurring for a total of a sixty month term. Second. Any further discussion on this? Hearing none, those in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion carries. Okay, liquor license approval. Don't have any new ones to report from, from Rachel at this time. But she is, uh, she's been signing off on them. I, I don't think she's had any since the last meeting to sign off. So I think, I think we're good for now. Uh, approval of licenses, permits, about vouchers, and applications. I make the motion to approve payroll warrant 23-19 for payroll from February 26th to March 11th, 2023, paid on March 15th, 2023, in the amount of $65,991.68. Also payable warrant 23-G17 with checks 22777 to 22831 for payables in the amount of 87000 $295.13 and the February general journal entries. Second. Any discussion? Those in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion carries. Um, approval of February 21st, 2023 minutes. I don't think we have a quorum, do we, on that? I don't believe we do, and I don't see those in my packet. I have the March 6th. Yeah, that's the one we had to re Well, the, the other one... We don't have a quorum anyway. Yeah. Um, okay, so we'll table that to next meeting. Uh, March 6th, 2023 minutes. I make the motion to approve the Monday, March 6, 2023 minutes uh, with slight changes to a couple of spelling issues. Um, one word uh, changing uh, president to precedent and just the moving of some headings and um, nothing, nothing uh, horrible or elaborate. I'll share those with Vince. Okay. <laughs> Now on the round table, uh, Tolbert? Um, I don't have anything. Did we have a second on the minutes? The second of the approval on the minutes? I can't, I don't recall if we had a second. Tour can't second. Oh, true, true. So I guess we'll table those. Table minutes. both of them, <laughs> but I can still share the changes. Thank okay. you. Make Round table flow. Nothing tonight. Thank you so much. And I just want to take and welcome Tor to the select board again. Most definitely. Welcome.
And any executive session tonight? No. No. Mr. Chair? Anything for uh, roundtable events? No. And Joe might too. Mr. Chair? Yeah, Joe. <laughs> I'm still here. But anyway, <laughs> um, if you're ready for roundtable, I just wanted to. Uh, let everybody know that the Borough and Fire Department did have a pie breakfast event this uh, last Saturday, um, and I think it was well attended with with over a hundred people. Um, it, it was, I think, it was a, a great opportunity for neighbors, friends to get out, and we had Ray Burke, Sam Burke, I think Donna Thunder and partner playing uh, music up there, and. Um, yeah, it was just a great time. I also want to say that we still have the Berlin Fire Department does have a position on their board of directors for a resident. Um, so if tour or, or flow, um, you know, I, I will throw it out there to anyone, spread the word, um, see if there's anyone that would be interested in joining that board. Um, that's it. I Thank want you. to add that I was there as well for the pie breakfast and I concur with everything Joe said and they all did a tremendous uh, amount of effort and uh, everyone seemed to really enjoy it and there was a lot of planning and um, it just was wonderful all the way around. Thank you all. Yeah. I didn't thank you Flo for coming to help but no, thank no you. that's that's quite all right it was my pleasure. But you all did a fabulous job. Anything else, Joe? No, I'm good, thank you. Um, entertain a motion to adjourn. I make the motion to adjourn tonight's regularly scheduled select board meeting. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. We are adjourned. <laughs>